Hello, and welcome to Top Story Daily Edition. I'm JNS Editor-in-Chief Jonathan Tobin. Thanks for joining me for another discussion on the most pressing issues in the Jewish world. Please like, subscribe, and give us good reviews when you listen to the show. Now let's get started. It was a very bad week for the presidents of Harvard University, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and the University of Pennsylvania. But as much as the discomfort and job security of the trio of academic bureaucrats put on the spot by Representative Elise Stefanik during a congressional hearing on anti-Semitism on college campuses is a focus of interest, no one should think that what they now say, or what happens to them, is of critical importance. On the contrary, the viral video of their appalling testimony is merely a symptom of the problem plaguing America's educational establishment and the rest of society. It is the toxic ideologies that have created these three pathetic examples of university leaders without a moral compass that we should be worried about, not their individual fates. As long as the schools they lead, and as long as most other such institutions, whether considered among the country's elite schools or not, remain captured by the woke mindset that has made critical race theory and intersectionality the prevailing orthodoxy, anti-Semitism there will be a given. To the New York Times and others on the left, the predicaments of Harvard's Claudine Gay, MIT's Sally Kornbluth, and Penn's Liz McGill were a prosecutorial trap, one into which they fell headlong. Throughout the hearing, while most of the Democrats lobbed softballs at the representatives of these schools, Stefanik and other Republicans had been pressing them to account for the rampant targeting of Jewish students on their campuses since the Hamas atrocities of October 7th. Stefanik had tried to get them to admit that pro-Hamas chants for Intifada, an invocation of the Palestinian terror campaign that cost the lives of more than 1,200 Jews, was evidence of calls for violence that breach these institutions' rules against bullying and harassment. So when she asked them whether calls for Jewish genocide constituted a violation of college policies, she expected them to say yes, and then to follow up with questions about their failure to enforce those regulations. Instead, the trio answered in a lawyerly fashion, saying that it depended on the context of the slurs, or if such language turned into actual When given opportunities to clarify and give a clear yes or no answer, they prevaricated, sometimes with arrogant contempt for the questions, in the case of gay or nervous smiles by McGill. The point of these questions was to highlight the failures of these schools to protect Jewish students while they coddled and encouraged the mobs on their campuses that had been harassing their peers while chanting for the destruction of the one Jewish state on the planet. Even Stefanik was surprised that the presidents, some of the most prestigious universities in the country, were at that moment more worried about being accused of taking sides against anti-Semitic students, whose vile behavior is being cheered on by so many among the administrators and faculty. Within 24 hours, both Gay and McGill backed her, with the latter posting a groveling apology on social media that did nothing to salvage her reputation. Indeed, a day before Penn's Board of Trustees was scheduled to meet virtually, to discuss what had become a crisis for the university's reputation, McGill submitted her resignation. Yet as foolish as their performance was, Stefanik shouldn't have been surprised. Indeed, no one should have been. Even if their testimony became an embarrassing viral moment that prompted condemnation not just from Jewish organizations and liberal academics, but from the White House and many Democratic politicians that Gay, McGill, and Kornbluth might have assumed would side with them. Though the controversy has generated criticisms from donors, and in the case of McGill led to her resignation, what Stefanik exposed was not just the trio's lack of preparedness and their inability to grasp how their institutional blindness to anti-Semitism appears to those outside of the leftist bubble in which they live. Instead, it was a moment that revealed the moral corruption that now exists at the heart of academic discourse. It's the product of these institutions' adoption of woke ideology that falsely labels those smearing Israel, calling it an apartheid state that needs to be decolonized as laudable idealists, and considers those who defend it 
as racists and white supremacists. The unspeakable crimes committed on October 7th in southern Israel by the Hamas terrorist organization that has run the Gaza Strip since 2007 have proved to be a clarifying moment. On that day, Islamist operatives carried out the largest mass slaughter of Jews since the Holocaust, along with gang rapes, torture, and the kidnapping of more than 200 men, women, and children. In response, Israel has done the only thing any sovereign nation could do. It decided to put an end to Hamas rule, to prevent terrorists from carrying out their pledge to repeat the, these outrages, as part of the campaign to destroy Israel from the river to the sea. Yet almost from the first moment that Hamas began this war, the response from the left-wing elites that dominate academia as well as other so-called progressives has been to adopt the Palestinian narrative, in which they are the victims and Israel the oppressor. In doing so, they have essentially ignored or erased any discussion of the Israeli terror victims. More than that, the anti-Israel protests almost immediately became expressions not so much emanating out of concern for Palestinian civilians being hurt or killed, because the terrorists use them as human shields, but rather of support for Hamas's goal of Israel's destruction and the slaughter of Jews. This was made clear by the chants heard in street protests, many American cities and on college campuses, supporting the From the River to the Sea mantra and Free Palestine that fantasizes about the elimination of the Jewish state. It's also demonstrated by the calls for intifada, which means support for more October 7th horrors visited upon Jews. That these sorts of things are being said by large numbers of people is as shocking and upsetting as the videos of anti-Semites tearing down posters that publicize the plight of those kidnapped by Hamas. While it's true that even hateful speech is protected by the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, Schools are not required to tolerate such behavior on their private campuses. In the current environment, in which woke ideology has become the prevailing orthodoxy in academia, institutions of higher education are notorious for their hostility to free speech. Those who dissent against leftist and anti-racist orthodoxy or point out that the woke catechism of diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, is hostile to a diversity of opinion, opposed to equality and inclusive only of certain approved minorities, a term interpreted as excluding, Jew, as excluding Jews, are routinely shunned and excluded from college life. Indeed, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, FIRE, ranked Harvard last among 254 universities and colleges when it comes to the protection of free speech. No one doubts that any individual student or group of students that advocated for the lynching, let alone genocide of African Americans or Hispanics, would be immediately expelled, and any teachers who joined them would be similarly booted off campus. Yet those who advocate for violence against Jews are rarely, if ever, punished for such behavior. The reason is that the now dominant ideologies, critical race theory and intersectionality, which falsely analogizes the war on Israel to the struggle for civil rights in the United States, grants a permission slip for anti-Semitism. Their advocates, who now largely run universities through DEI offices, whose woke commissars have free reign on campuses, have adopted these big lies and treat those who disagree with disdain or worse. They have spread throughout the academic departments that administer the humanities and rule both admissions and issues of dis discipline. The people who run these institutions act as if the main problem with the reactions to October 7th is the opprobrium that decent people are heaping on those who are either openly supporting Hamas or merely calling for a ceasefire that would allow the terrorists to get away with mass murder. That point of view was best summed up by New York Times columnist Michelle Goldberg, an opponent of Israel's existence piece about the issue, published on the day of the university's president's testimony, sounded the alarm about the alleged threat to free speech posed by the backlash against campus Jew hate. Goldberg is upset about the way that support for Hamas is proving that anti-Zionism is synonymous with anti-Semitism. In a subsequent column, she lamented the way the university president stepped into a trap 
that would suppress pro-Palestinian speech. That Goldberg's views are treated as mainstream by the time, rather than the rantings of extremist hate mongers that should be confined to the fever swamps of the far left and the far right, demonstrates how the same woke mindset now controls the corporate mainstream media. But the reaction to Stefanik's cross-examining of those university presidents also shows most Americans don't share Goldberg's hateful opinions. What she, her editors, and left-wing academics around the nation want to do is to redefine anti-Semitism, to make it kosher to call for Israel's destruction and the genocide of its people. But you don't have to hold a degree from Harvard, Penn, or MIT to know that if ind individuals wish to deprive the Jewish people of rights, no one would think of denying to any other people or group, such as the right to freedom and sovereignty in their ancient homeland, as well as the right to self-defense. You are practicing discrimination. Those who reacted to the viral video by calling for the three presidents to resign aren't wrong. And alumni and other donors who are now threatening to stop giving to the three schools in order to force the resignations of the remaining two who hasn't resigned are well-meaning. Still, the problem is not the figureheads running these schools, but the governing ideologies and woke bureaucracies that they represent. What must change is not the personnel, heads of these schools, but the way they are run. It is DEI departments, coupled with the teaching of critical race theory and toxic intersectional myths that promote not just anti-Semitism, but hatred of America and permanent racial division that must go, not just gay, McGill, or Cornblue. And if that doesn't happen, and there is little evidence that the leftist establishment is ready to give up their control of academia or other segments of society that they have captured, then the response must be to strip the institutions of their federal funds. American families must also stop sending their children to these schools only to be indoctrinated. If regular citizens want to do something about anti-Semitism on campus, they can't stop at firing a few token administrators who are the products of a corrupt system. They must work towards the overthrow of an establishment that is fueling hatred against Jews. Thanks for listening. Please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition and every week for the full hour-long JNS TV program. Whether you are listening to us on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, any of the other podcast platforms, or on the JNS YouTube channel, Please like and or subscribe to Top Story, click on the bell for notifications, and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at jns.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself.